Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're in a little different space here. I'm sitting down. What a concept. Uh, there you go. Activating yeast part two. If you did not tune into part one last Thursday, do go ahead and check that out. I particularly like that video where we were taking a look at, in terms of temperature and food, what uh, is needed to activate yeast that is dormant. Yeast is, believe it or not, an organism in and of itself. And we're going to think about what kind of organism might it be uh, later in this video. Uh, you are going to need your science notebook and a pencil or pen. There is a chart behind me that you're going to copy down to take observations in a second, but I'll move my big head out of the way. Don't worry, you don't need to do it right this second. And then down here, there's our I cans today. I can make a detailed observations of a scientific phenomenon, and I can make a claim that answers the focus question and support that claim with observational evidence of being able to say, I think that blank, that yeast prefers blank, and I think that because blank. Let's get into it. All right, here we go. Here's the word wall. Here's me. I'm sitting on a wobble stool. Can you tell? Are you getting dizzy? Okay, I'll stop. So, we last week took a look at yeast. In this case, today it's yeast mixed with something, but um, <clears throat> last week we took a look at yeast, which is an organism. Weird to think about that we're putting live organisms in our sourdough bread, but we are. Sourdough starter is like a living, breathing thing. It's often more high maintenance than a pet cat, if you can believe it, right? Bread is more high maintenance than a cat, turns out, yes. And thinking about yeast as an organism, and when you buy yeast at the store, it's dormant, so it's not active, it's not moving around, it's not needing to um, consume anything. <clears throat> we wake it up or we activate it by two things. One, it needs a little bit of warmth to help wake up, Okay, and we saw that when we compared our um, room temperature water to our hot water. And it also needs some food, something to give it the energy to get going in addition to that temperature. So we figured out those two things, that yeast needs a warm environment and it needs some food to wake up. But let's go further and let's think about what kinds of food does yeast prefer in order to wake itself up from dormancy here? So you are going to get and look at, I'll go this way, um, this is going to be the chart that you're going to copy down in your science notebook, okay? We're going to test three different things because last time we tested a granola bar. We dropped a granola bar in with our hot water and we got a big reaction, okay? Um, so we took a look at some of the things that you might find in a granola bar. There's flour, uh, sugar, oats, that way. My video is mirrored, so I'm like, it's over here, but it's actually over there. Oats and our control, okay? So we're gonna test those four things today. And in order to test what kinds of food, what kinds of nutrition yeast needs to activate and yeast likes best, we're gonna keep everything else the same. So if you look over here, I'll move in a second, in each bag, we're gonna have the same measurements of everything else. So all that we're looking at is the only difference, the only variable is the kind of food in the bag. So in each bag, there's gonna be five grams of yeast, 50 milliliters of warm water, and five grams of a food source. So five grams of flour in one bag, five grams of sugar in one bag, five grams of oats in one bag, and uh, no food in the control, because we want to know what it looks, how it compares to just hot water on its own. All right, make sure this chart is in your science notebook. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make observations on what we see. I'm gonna give some time for you to see each sample, and then you can make some observations. And then the next thing we're gonna do down here, the volume of the bag, and what we're going to do is we're going to test and we're going to measure that volume. So first, just to give you a little um, 
what it looked like. So here's my yeast, and this one has flour in it as my demo. There's one that's been cooking for, well, not cooking, but soaking and activating for um, almost 20 minutes now, according to my timer. And what we did, this is again, five grams of each. And I measured out 50 milliliters, you can see the 50 there, 50 milliliters of water into a syringe. And I'm gonna add that to my bag. Get all the coverage there, ta-da. Give it a little shake. Now, I wanna take as much air as I can out of this bag before I close it, okay? Because what we want to measure, we saw last time that when yeast activates, its waste product is a gas. It's actually carbon dioxide gas. So we wanna measure the volume of that gas as well. So I wanna take as much air out of that bag as I can. As you can see, it's pretty flat. And then I've sealed it up so uh, the air or whatever gas that comes off of this as it activates uh, doesn't escape. We wanna be able to measure it. Now, once our bags have, you'll see them in a second, I know, they're right over here. Um, once they've been given time to activate up so we can see what's going on in there, we're gonna use this tool to measure the volume. As you can see, there's a gauge there on the side in groups of 50 milliliters. And there's this little plunger thing. And basically what's gonna happen, I'm gonna show you with my demo, is the bag is gonna go in the tube. There we go. And then top goes on. And then, Nope. And then the plunger is going to get pushed down with one finger, not super hard because we don't want to pop it, okay, until we really can't push it down with one finger anymore. And as you can see, our gauge and our line is at zero, okay, when we push it down with one finger. The reason for that is, is that this tool, this little volume tube, was designed specifically for this investigation. Okay, so we want to know the change from zero. So if our zero is 50 milliliters of water, five grams of yeast, five grams of food, and a bag, it'll be at zero. If there's been a change in volume, we will see that because the plunger will meet resistance at a higher rate, meaning there's more stuff filling this space, meaning there is more volume. Okay, so... The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at our control. And remember this was just, I just put it in here. So the well, first thing we're gonna do, I'm gonna look. There's our experiment. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm gonna move you over. And then the first one we're gonna look at is the control. So find the control column there. And you're gonna make observations about the control sample. Oop, go that way, there you go. Out the control sample. It is warm. Uh, on the temperature gauge, it is still reading 40 degrees Celsius, which is a little bit hotter than our, our resting body temperature is about 37 degrees Celsius. That's our 98.6 Fahrenheit. So 40 degrees Celsius is about, it's about 103 degrees, somewhere in there. Okay, it's like, it's pretty good bath water. I, I, would, I would, a little bit warmer than your body temperature is kind of that ideal sort of bath water there. All right, so making observations. What do you see? What do you notice? Rather, uh, other than my fingers, focus on the sample. Okay, are there a lot of bubbles? Remember last time we saw bubbles? Are there very many bubbles here? Not really, huh, not very many bubbles there. Okay, now, Let's take a look, now that we've looked at the control, let's take a look at the first one, which is flour. So find your flour column up there on your chart. There it is, right there. And you're making observations about the sample with five grams of flour added. 
check this one out. Okay, it can be a little hard to see. There's a big clumpy up here that didn't quite get mixed in. Okay, what do you notice? I definitely see some more bubbles here. Wonder if that means there's been some gas released or is it just trapped bubbles in there from when I shook it up? We'll find out when we measure the volume. Okay, if that's really trapped gas in there um, that's been released as a waste product by the yeast, we'll see that in the volume tube when we measure it. Okay, take a look. I know this isn't like the most ideal way to be observing. Ideally, we'd be doing it in class, but we are gonna make the best of it. Okay, 10 more seconds on our flower observation. Try and move it around a little bit so you can see some different views here. I'm trying not to shake it up because again, shaking it up creates those bubbles, but we want to know if the yeast created the bubbles or not. So I'm doing as little jostling as possible. Okay, that was our flower sample. Next, we've got sugar. And we've got some stuff going on with the sugar. Take a look at this. Big time bubbles went all the way up, almost like two thirds of the way up the bag here with all these bubbles. I'll flip it over the other side. There's some really big bubbles in here. Gosh. and how much of that carbon dioxide gas has been released. We're gonna find out when we measure it. Okay, keep looking. Look at the detail on those bubbles there. So there's the bottom of our bag, and then that's how high those bubbles go up. If you compare it to our control, there's our control, and then there's our sugar. So definitely something happening with our sugar here. There's our control and there's our sugar. Take about 10 more seconds and make some observations. Okay, last one. Last one of our samples is gonna be our five grams of oatmeal. Now, one important thing to think about with this oatmeal, as you can see, there's definitely some bubbleage there, some foaminess there. Uh, one caveat with this oatmeal, it is instant oatmeal. So it's not just oats, there is a little bit of added flavoring, which includes a little bit of added sugar. So not the most, uh, <clears throat> not the most um, consistent of an investigation on my part, but these were the oats that I had, so we're making do. But definitely some big bubbles there. Okay, really cool little bubble structure there, down there at the bottom. And there's the back side. You can see some of those whole oats floating around there on the bottom. Take about 15 more seconds. Make some observations of this last one for our oats. Okay. I'm gonna Move the laptop over this way. There we go. Hello. Um, and actually, it's backlit. That's silly. Let's do it this way. There we go. That makes more sense. All right. So <clears throat> now it is time for us to do some measuring with our volume tube here. So we're going to start with our control, as we usually do. Now remember, here's our control. Still sealed. 
goes into the tube, lid on, and then we're gonna push down with one finger until we can't anymore. Aha. Just like we suspected, our control is at zero, right there. Okay, our plunger has gone down, it is at zero. We've got no extra volume added. We can actually put that on our chart behind me. So volume of the bag for our control, we have zero milliliters. Okay, next one. Let's try our flour next. I know it's not, um, I should have put the thing in order. But Okay, flour, remember we had a few bubbles with the flour, but we're gonna see if those were bubbles from uh, the bag getting kind of shooken up or jostled, or if this was some sort of release of gas. If it's release of gas, we'll see because our plunger will stop before it reaches zero, which means there's been some um, change in our volume. Okay, here we go. One finger, push, 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 push. There we go. Aha. So we've, I'm pushing. <laughs> And we've got 50 milliliters. So for the flour, we're going to, mm, smells like a bread factory in here. For our flour, we're gonna put 50 milliliters. Okay, oops, that's a tiny M and a giant L. Thank you. And yes, when you abbreviate milliliters, you do always do a capital L. I forget why, but you do. I think it's not to, so it doesn't get confused with a one or to get confused with any other number of measurement, but that is the, um, that is the convention is to capitalize your L in milliliters. Okay, next, sugar. And again, we had our bag's looking puffy here, so we should see a change here. Okay, bag in, careful. Whoa, it's already like barely, oh no. Okay, <laughs> we'll see, this is, I don't wanna pop the bag here, but who knows what's gonna happen. Okay, here we go, plunger in, pushing down with one finger, I, the, this is not an act. <laughs> like legitimately, it's it's done right there, at about five hundred fifty milliliters. Ugh. I'm serious. That's it. So I'll big time, big time, big time. There we go. Okay, 550. Now let's see what the oats, the oats are the one I'm interested in. I'm very, very interested in. Um, because it's kind of that middle ground. Where's our oatmeal? There it is. Right, is there, oh, whew. Thought for a second my bag was spilling. It was just kind of, it's just kind of laying flat, so it's spreading out. Whew. Did not want a yeasty mess all over the place. Okay, here's our oatmeal. Remember this did have a little added sugar in it but not the same amount, not the full five grams of sugar like there were in the sugar bag. So my hypothesis is this is gonna be somewhere above 50, but less than 550. Let's find out. Plunger in, lid closed, and here we go. One finger, push. And right there, at about 200 is where we are going to stop. And you can really, you know, if I pushed like, if I just like slammed on it, 
I could get it lower than 200, but I'd probably also pop the bag and make a mess, so I'm not gonna do that. So 200 milliliters is what we're gonna go with for the oats. And remember, so this had no food. This was flour, so it had no sugar. The oats had a little bit of sugar. And this was all sugar. So, taking a look at our data. Is there a conclusion, is there a claim we can draw to answer what is needed to activate yeast from dormancy and what kind of food, in particular, what food ingredients do yeast prefer? Are we seeing any sort of connection here? Hmm. I can't wait to see your answer in your exit ticket on Google Classroom. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Uh, writing group A, I will see you in about five minutes on the Zoom room. Uh, otherwise, work on your exit ticket. We are gonna meet at 2.15 for closing meeting um, to go over um, some reader's workshop and some book group um, expectations. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, this should be available for replay in like 10 minutes. So if you do need to watch it again, I highly encourage it. And thank you to those of you that have been watching it again, because you get even more out of it. If you, uh, the more times you watch it and the more times you go back and look at things you missed. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Good luck on the exit ticket. We'll see you soon.